as well as a demo on um, lock picking and a, a lot of other exciting things outside. So please feel free to visit all those places. Well, uh, to kick off the event this morning, we are pleased to have with us the first, our, our first keynote speaker for, for today, Mr. Lance Spitzner. I think he needs no introduction to most of you here. He's a founder of the HoneyNet project and uh, is considered to be the leader in the field of HoneyNet and HoneyPot research. And he has authored many books and uh, articles on security. And uh, without uh, wasting any more time, I give you, uh, let's have a warm welcome to the Lance Spitzner. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, this is actually my first time in KL, or actually my first time in Malaysia. So I'm very excited to be here. Just wanted to thank the uh, Hack in the Box team for inviting me. All right, for the next hour or so, um, I'm going to be talking about something that's relatively new, something that's surprisingly relatively unknown, uh, FastFlex. Um, first, a little bit about myself. As mentioned before, my name is Lance Spitzner. I'm founder of the HoneyNet Project, and I'll be talking in a moment about what exactly that is. Uh, I've been in information security for about 11 years now. Four of those years were with Sun Microsystems, where I helped travel around the world securing Sun's customers. And that was a lot of fun, because I got a lot of exposure to all the different problems around the world. Uh, I worked primarily in Southeast Asia, um, Singapore, and Philippines along those lines. I also spent seven years in the US military, which was surprisingly how I got started in information security. If you're interested later, I can tell you how I went from driving tanks to honeypot research. If we have time, I'll go into that. But there, there is actually a link. Real quick, about the HoneyNet project, I just want to give you some background on the organization so you know where the information is coming from that I'm about to present. The HoneyNet Project is a nonprofit organization, uh, international. What you see up on the map right here is some of the chapters we have around the world. We have some new chapters now, including Mexico, Costa Rica. And what it is is primarily volunteers attempting to learn about information threats and then sharing what we learn. And that's in part what I'm doing today. Uh, we've been around since about 2000, so we've been around for about seven or eight years. And as you can see, we've got a very global perspective. Um, China, Japan, Philippines, from an Asian perspective, uh, Pakistan, a great deal in Europe. So what's really neat is you get a global feel. And one of the big things we quickly learned a long time ago is we're all facing the same problems, same challenges, and same threats. Some of the key points about the organization and some of the key points of, about the information I'm going to present. First of all, our organization focuses on trends. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, a trend. Uh, we don't really go into specific vulnerabilities, malware types like that. There's already a huge variety of organizations that do a very good job of that. What we try to do is give you actionable information. In other words, we're going to give you information or intelligence about the bad guys. But we want to present that in a way where you can do something about it. We firmly believe that the best way to defend against a threat is to know that threat. So we're going to give you some information, like I am here today, better understand a threat, and you should be able to better defend against it. And then as I mentioned earlier, it's primarily volunteers. We are up. Firmly committed to open source. All the tools we release are open source. All the information we release is open source. Because we believe that the information needs to get out there. OK, now I'm going to start shifting from our organization to the presentation today. Start really getting into the technical meat of the uh, presentation. As I've mentioned, we've been tracking the trends since 1998. I've been deploying honeypots since 1998. I mentioned earlier, uh, I was going to real quick discuss how I got from the military to honeypots. As a tank officer, I had nothing to do with computers, just driving around in tanks, got to shoot things, you know, a lot of fun stuff. But one of the things they teach in the military is you have to understand your threat. You have to know who you're dealing with, how they operate, so you can defend against it. So in the military, there's organizations that give you that information. As a tank officer, I had to know and understand tank threats, in this case primarily Soviet, T-72 tank, how they operated, and I was trained a lot. 
on how their, their tanks operated, their command structure, three tanks to a platoon, three platoons to a company, simply because I had to defend against those threats. When I transferred out of the US military into information security, I once again had a mission to defend against a threat. In this case, it was a cyber threat. Now back in 1998, 1999, when I transitioned, there was no information on threats. Maybe some technical write-ups on the exploits on how the bad guys broke into computers. But who were the bad guys? Why were they breaking into computers? What did they do after they broke into them? So that's where I started using the idea of honeypots. Now, honeypots were not new back then, but nobody was really deploying them, and nobody was deploying them to capture information. Now, I decided I was going to put something out there to learn about the bad guys, but I'm a horrible coder, and I'm a pretty lazy individual. I like to do things now. I'm not a very good planner. So the one thing I knew was firewalls. I just took some computers. In this case, I think it was like Linux Red Hat 5.0, something along those lines put it on my wife's dining room table, put it behind a firewall, and just wanted to see if anybody would hack into it. This was about 98. Sure enough, within 15 minutes, the computer got broken into, and I started learning about the bad guys. So I knew this was a technique that I could use to learn. And over the years, those ideas have grown. Now, there's lots of different honeypots out there. There's client honeypots, honey tokens, Google honeypots, web application honeypots, server honey, all sorts of stuff. But it's just an idea of gathering information about the bad guys. And that's actually how I went from the military to honeypots. Now, something I've been seeing watching these individuals for the past 10 years, as commonly known, is this shift from, in the old days, hackers were, in many ways, just individuals out to explore the internet or gain notoriety, make a name for themselves. Around 2001, 2002, we saw a shift where these hackers realized they could start making money. And then within the past couple years, we've seen in a lot of ways it's no longer hackers breaking into computers, but organized crime adopting the hackers. Simply because with organized crime, and I believe Miko is going to be going into this in much greater detail, organized crime is so profitable. Think about it. Extortion, identity theft, fraud has been around for thousands of years. The bad guys have adopted it now simply because they can make so much more money with so less risk. And what's been impressive, especially in the past 18 months, is the level of sophistication of the bad guys. They have simply accelerated their abilities. Amazing stuff. You can't keep up. It's one of the reasons why I look forward to coming to these conferences. So you can learn from so many different experts on just all the new and advanced techniques the bad guys are taking. It's very impressive. Today, I'm going to talk about something that's happening all over the internet, but is not well known. It's a technique called fast flux that cyber criminals are using today to make it much more difficult to track them down, much more difficult to shut them down. In other words, the end result is they have a better, stronger return on investment. That is the one common theme I've seen in the past couple years, is it's all about return on investment, or ROI. A lot of times when I present to senior management, I tell them, you really probably don't need a security expert to present to you about cybercrime. You should have somebody like an economics major presenting to you. Because if you understand the economics of the threat, then you can understand how they operate, what motivates them, how they communicate, things along those lines. So when I'm presenting here on fast flux, keep that in mind. It's all about return on investment. What are the bad guys going to do six months from now? Whatever gives them the greatest return on investment. So it's one good way to kind of keep a theme of how they're operating. Okay, what is the goal of fast flux? Well, you're looking at it. Bank of India. As well known, a couple days ago, they were compromised. Uh, in fact, it happened right before I got on the plane to fly out to uh, uh, Malaysia here. Now, what's interesting is it's becoming a more common, common technique. A year ago, two years ago, malicious websites were websites the bad guys put up and then would direct traffic to those websites. Or they would be type of a dodgy website, such as online gambling or things along those lines. Now the bad guys are just breaking into sites that are trusted and then inserting their own malicious code. Or, excuse me, more often, 
simply um, code that redirects you to a uh, malicious website. In this case, in the uh, Bank of India, it was simply iframe insertion. And I'm sure you folks will be um, learning more about iframes if you haven't already. It's just a very, very common technique for inserting code linked from another website. Now, what does this have to do with FastFlux? What you're going to learn is how the bad guys can set up a malicious site that you can't shut down. So what happens in the case of the Bank of India when it's linked to malicious websites that are distributing malicious code? You find the domain names. In fact, um, I forget what some of the domain names that were used in the linking of the uh, Bank of India site. But what it's ends up happening is you look up the IP address, you shut down the system. That You go find that IP address and you shut it down. The problem is, is by the time you shut down that IP address, that website's gone to somewhere else. Five, ten minutes later, you shut down that IP address. The system is going somewhere else. How can the bad guys make these websites move so fast, these malicious websites or sites distributing malicious code or phishing websites? It's come to the point now where we can't shut them down because it's moved. It's migrated to another one. And it's doing that by the minutes. We can't go ahead and shut the name servers down because the name servers are moving. 10, 20, 30 minutes. We can't track down the bad guys because their sites are always hopping around. How do they do this? How do they create websites? How do they create this infrastructure that's constantly shifting? That's what fast flux is. Now, it's surprising. We've been seeing fast flux happening in the wild for over a year now, but there's been very little discussion about it. You mainly see discussion about it with the service providers people providing your internet service. You see it discussed on mail lists such as Nanog. But outside of the service provider realm, you really don't see this being discussed. So one of the goals of the HoneyNet project is to develop awareness about this. Because this is how the bad guys are defending against us. They know we're starting to get to the point where we can react rapidly to shut systems and networks down. But we, this doesn't work anymore because their networks are shifting so fast. So a little bit more, what is fast flux? How does it work? And what can we do about it? Well, the, this would be the definition of fast flux. It's actually the combination of two things. First of all, you may have heard of things such as round robin DNS or um, very short time to live TTL. Basically, what it is is when the bad guys take a domain name, some type of no name, and there's an IP address resolving to that name, that IP address is changing every five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever the bad guys set it to. Then they combine this with a reverse proxy or a redirector. I'm going to show you an image of this in a moment. Basically, the end result is we cannot shut down the bad guys' networks nor can we track down who the bad guys are because they're hidden behind this wall of disposable systems. So what does this look like? Oh, first of all, uh, so why do this? What's the purpose? Well, as always, when the bad guys change their tools, when they change their techniques, ultimately think of how is this making them more money? What is their return on investment? Because that's their end goal. In general, the bad guys don't do anything. The cyber criminals don't do anything unless it's going to make them more money. Well, how does this make more money? It creates a structure, an infrastructure for them that is much simpler. And I'll explain in a moment why it's simpler. It creates disposable front ends. They have lots of disposable assets, hacked computers. It's just 10,000 systems. They'll just go all through them. And then it protects their back-end servers, the phishing servers, the malicious web servers, the impact servers distributing the uh, malicious code. So let's take a moment here and look at this image. This kind of gives us a better idea of what FastFlux is all about. Why do we care? Well, look at the image to your left. On the left, let's see here, we've got a point here. On the left over here, you have just a normal web browsing site. Your computer, you fire it up, you go to a web server. Well, what happens? It sends an H, um, HTTP get to the web server, and then the web server responds. Boom. That's how normal web activity works. And then two, three years ago, this is how phishing would work, or a malicious website would work. 
Pretend that that server at the top is actually a malicious system. Mal malicious in that it's a phishing website stealing authentication. It's distributing client exploits. That's the bad guy server. Now, in the old days, this worked for them. But we eventually caught on, and what we would do, we'd put processes in place where as soon as phishing email would go out, we'd identify the IP address of the phishing server, and then we'd shut that system down. Wham. Well, then the bad guys would have to rebuild a new server, put it out, new phishing emails, things along those lines. Well, that was a lot of work for the bad guys. It was, we were taking money from them because we were shutting these systems down. We were impacting their return on investment. Anytime we impact their return on investment, the bad guys will change so they can start making more money again. Well, around 2006, they changed. And what you see on the slide to the right is how they changed. And this is what happens. Say, for example, in this case, I think we're actually using the word example. Yes, we are. www.example.com. It's a website set up by the bad guys to distribute malicious code. Maybe they have MPAC um, toolkit. Maybe they have distributors like iframes, things along those lines. But what happens is this, is the IP address pointing to www.example.com does not point to the malicious web server. It just points to a hacked desktop computer, perhaps your friends at work, your sister's computer, uh, your mother's computer at home. And what happens is, is example.com points to that computer. Now, that computer is not the, actually the web server. It's just the IP address pointing to the web server. Now, when you connect to that computer, it's actually a hack computer that then takes your HTTP request, forwards it to the back end server, what we call the mothership. And then the mothership gives the web pages to the proxy, and then the proxy gives it to you. So what ends up happening is the IP address associated with the web server, or email server, or any type of server, is not actually the server, but a proxy associated with it. Now what happens is the bad guys will have 5, 10, 100, 1,000 of these proxy servers. And what happens is the IP address, for example.com, points to this computer. Five minutes later, it points to this computer, a different proxy. Five minutes later, it points to another one. And then five minutes later, it points to another one. Now, the back-end mother ship that is actually the web server never changes. So the bad guys only need to build one of those. Much simpler. These proxies are nothing more than disposable hacked bot proxies that they control, and then every five, ten minutes is changing. So the problem is now... When you get that phishing email, when you learn of Bank of America pointing to hacked websites that are distributing malicious code, what ends up happening is when you get that IP address and you shut that IP address down, you just simply shut down the proxy. Five minutes later, there's going to be another one. And five minutes later, there's going to be another one. So it's almost like a game of, in the US, what we call whack-a-mole. You know, as soon as one system pops up, one of the proxies pop up and you shut it down, another one pops up. So the problem for us is the bad guys have a very robust structure. We're not actually shutting down the web servers. We're simply shutting down the proxies. And five minutes later, there's going to be another proxy. So they do this two ways. First, these systems they break into have special proxy software uh, installed on them. I'll go into more on that in a minute. Then DNS. In other words, the DNS names are always changing. So we have to go and look in the DNS. I think this is very slick. It's amazing. Think about it. The guys, this is great for disaster recovery. Very robust infrastructure. We can't shut them down. All we're doing is shutting the proxies down. It's amazing. In some ways, the enterprise management software that they develop is in some ways simpler easier and more robust than sometimes the enterprise management software we use in the uh, legitimate world. So this slide shows you how it looks at the network level. Now let's take a look at the DNS records. For those of you unfamiliar with DNS, what you're looking at is what we would call a DIG record. 
config is a Unix command line tool for finding information on domain names. Now what you're looking at here is the actual domain names of, I believe this was a pharmaceutical site. In other words, selling fake drugs. So what would happen is, is if somebody tried to shut this website down, you would just be shutting those proxies I was talking about. Now in this case, you see it's called divewithsharks.hk. The bad guys, for some reason, tend to like domain names that end in .hk or end in domains .info. They're very cheap. They're very disposable. The registrars um, tend to work with the criminals. In fact, the criminals may actually own the registrars. So now take a look. If you look at the top, what you're looking at are the IP addresses associated with divewithsharks.hk. Now remember, this is the actual malicious website. The information at the bottom is the name servers. In this case, that information will not change. The name servers are the computers that give information out about the DNS resolution. In this case, you see there's five different computers that resolve to this divewithsharks.hk. Now look at those IP addresses on how they resolve. Those aren't on hosting web farms. No, those are simple cable connections. That is because they're simple home computers. If you look at this, the Shaw Cable, based out of Calgary, Canada. Um, some of the other ones here. These are just nothing but simple service networks, home providers, cable networks. Those are people like your mother, your sister, who've been hacked, and they're acting as proxies. They don't know it. Now, we're going to take a look at the same DNS record for the same computer here in a short period of time, I think in about 30 minutes. Let's compare. Yeah. Look at the top, please. 30 minutes later, you see we do this DNS pull for the same domain name. Highlighted in bold, the IP address has changed for two computers. The other three are still online, but these two have changed. In other words, when you connect, if you try to connect to this website, a couple of the proxies have changed. So if we shut down the old ones, it doesn't matter because 30 minutes later, there's a new one. Now, if we look again in another 30 minutes, you'll notice that they have all changed right here. All the IP addresses are different computers, except this one right here is actually one from up here. It came back. What's interesting is the bad guys tend to have some type of uptime measurement capability, where whichever proxies are up the longest and have the most bandwidth are the ones that are kept fed back into the DNS. So they have some type of keep alive checks going on. But the end result is if you look at the top and then look at the bottom, all the IP addresses associated with the web server are changing because the proxies are changing. So if we, the good guys, saw divewithsharks.hk being evil, and we looked up the IP addresses, and we shut down all those IP addresses, even if we were able to do that within an hour, it doesn't matter. Because an hour later, whoop, five new systems are up. And remember, once again, these are nothing more than the proxies. So this creates a very robust network that's very hard to shut down. Now, for those of you who are familiar with DNS, you're probably thinking, why bother trying to shut down all these proxies? Why not go for the throat and go after the name server? Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with DNS, the name server is the authoritative server that gives out the information to all the other, um, about the, um, it's the name server is what gives out all the information to all the other DNS servers about the systems. If you can take out the name server, then they can't constantly be changing all the different IP addresses. So the name server is what we want to shut down right here. And in this case, you see it over here. Now, the bad guys know this. They know that if we can control or shut down their name servers, they can't distribute new DNS records, and then the uh, domain name will just stop changing and eventually time out. So the bad guys have created something what we call sing, uh, double flux. What I have just described here is what was called single flux. We saw single flux because only one element of the DNS records are changing, just in um, the, uh, what we call the A records. Of whenever we go ahead and we translate the I, uh, domain name to an IP address. 
Double flex is when not only the A records change, but the name server records change. So they're constantly changing. This means you don't have any way of shutting the system down. What you would have to do is actually go to the registrars. A registrar is nothing more than the organization where you register the domain name. So folks, like if anybody here has ever registered a domain name, such as with Network Solutions, GoDaddy, whatever, those are the registrars. Then what they do is they give you the information. They're the ones that say where your name servers are. Then you go ahead and set up your DNS records in the name servers. Now the problem is, is if we can't shut down the name servers, we have to go to the registrars. And as I mentioned before, some registrars will work with you and help you shut down domain names, such as divewithsharks.hk. But there's, I believe, 600 to 800 different registers, registrars excuse me, on the internet. Some of those are most likely owned by the bad guys or have relationships with the bad guys. So they've created a pretty robust method for protecting themselves. But let's go in again, once again, some examples of what um, double flux is and what it looks like when the name servers are changing. Now what I just discussed, what I just gave examples of is single flux. Look to your left. As I said before, what happens is here, the client, or we should call the victim. What happens is, is they resolve the domain name, in this case example.com, and then they go to uh, the proxy server. In this case, um, what do we have here? All right, what happens here is that what we're showing here is the, uh, the query. It goes for, to the main um, registrar or the, or the root server, points to the name server, boom. This right here is the weak point. If we can shut down the name server in single flux, then we shut down their ability to constantly be changing the IP addresses. What the bad guys do in double flux is the zombies, the proxies, are also the name servers. So the name servers are also changing all the time. If you try to shut down a name server, 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half later, the name server has changed. So even now, the bad guys are creating a very, very difficult network to uh, shut down. So what you see here on the left for single flux, they go to the rootserver.com, they find out the name server for, in this case, example.com, you go to example.com, and that's the guy that's going ahead and keeps giving you all the different IP addresses. In double flux, what the bad guys have done is it says when you go to the uh, root server for .com and it points you to the name server, the name server is nothing more than a bunch of different IP addresses that are proxies that will then go ahead and do DNS proxy, not just web proxy, but DNS proxy back to the mothership. So now we can't even communicate directly with the name servers. We're going through another layer of protection. So what the bad guys have done now is anytime we try to shut anything down, it doesn't matter because it's always changing. Let's take a look at some records. Once again, these are real records from uh, the bad guys. I think taken maybe in February or March. In this case, it's a MySpace attack. What it is, is it's a domain name that looks a lot like MySpace. What they're dealing is stealing MySpace login accounts. So this is more of a phishing attack than it is a malicious web server attack. Now, if you take a look at the top, it's called login.my, but if you look at it, it's misspelled, mylspace.com. So it's using a domain name that looks very similar to MySpace, but in case it's not. Now, let's go up here. There's the five IP addresses. These, remember, are nothing more than proxies. So when you try to connect to this phishing website, you're actually connecting to reverse web proxies. Also, take a look over here, and here are the five name servers. And then look at the, uh, the address records, the A records for the name servers. Once again, now, if you look at these address records, Roadrunner Network, Comcast, SBC Global, Ameritech, these are all predominantly common service provider networks. So these IP addresses are, once again, nothing more than home networks. So not only are the web proxies, but the DNS proxies are um, part of this fast flux network. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens here. This is four minutes later. All right, we, all we're doing is we're constantly doing DNS queries. Four minutes later, all five IP addresses that are associated, associated with the domain name is changing. That's fast. 
So no matter how fast you are, if you found out, when MySpace finds out there's a phishing website and they go out to those IP addresses and shut those IP addresses down, even if they can do it within five minutes, which is fast, it doesn't matter because the phishing websites have all migrated. And keep in mind, remember, it's not actually the web server that's changing, it's those proxies that are nothing more than disposable assets. So it's pretty easy for the bad guys to manage. But what is very slick here is if we went ahead and go, okay, we don't have the ability to shut these systems down. If we shut down all five name servers, then DNS won't replicate anymore. People can't do DNS queries anymore. The caches will time out, it'll expire, and the system will shut down. So the bad guys know we can go after their name servers. Let's look what happens at their name servers. So now look at this slide right here. What I've done is on the next page, we see the same DNS query. There is the same DNS query. But what I'm going to show you now is the name servers have also changed. In this case, about 90 minutes later. Look at these five IP addresses right here at the bottom. Now, we look at this five minutes later, I'm sorry, 90 minutes later, and you see all five name servers have changed. So even if we shut down the name servers, the information is still going to replicate on through DNS. In this case, if you look again, SBC Global, Comcast, Shaw Cable, service provider networks. So this is why it's commonly oops, a service provider problem. So even if we shut down the name servers, now, the only thing that we can do to shut these systems down, go to the next level, is go to the registrars, the GoDaddy's, the um, network solutions, things like that, and talk to the registrars and say, hey, this is an evil domain name. Pull it out of the root servers so that it, it just pull it off the internet so it disappears. And a lot of the registrars will work with you. However, as I mentioned before, and um, there's a couple floating around in East Europe that are not friendly. They don't work with folks in the West, or they won't folk work folks in the East who are security professionals. They're working with the criminal community. So the problem is, a lot of times in these cases, we can't even shut them down at the registrar level. Or they're just changing domain names themselves so fast. So what you've got here is a bad guy that's constantly changing his presence on the internet. You shut him down some one place, wham, he's somewhere else. And they're doing this at both the web server and the name server level. Which makes for a pretty hard guy to track down. Like I said, what, something that always impresses me is the, just how rapidly the bad guys change and the level of sophistication. And this is pretty impressive. Okay, so we were pretty interested in these fast flux. And basically what it is, is it's malware that's installed on hack computers and does this proxy on the hack computers. So we took this malware, installed it on one of our honey nets, we infected one of our own systems, and then ran it to see what it would do, how it communicated with the mothership, the bad guys, things along those lines. And this is what we saw. In this case, what we did is the web uh, malware is called webby.exe. We ran it. Uh, that's the MD5. As we note here, first it does a connectivity check. All it does is it attempts to resolve Google.com. If it can resolve Google.com, it knows the system it infected is connected to the internet and is now usable. Then what it does is it registers to the mothership, similar to a botnet. You can almost think of this as a bot proxy. But you notice it doesn't do any type of IRC join. It does an HTTP GET. And you see the HTTP GET there. All it's really doing is getting, um, right here what it's doing first is it's registering. And if you look at the information here when it registers, what it's actually doing is giving information about the home system. And that long number you see there, part of it, what of it is, is a user account number. In other words, there is an account number associated with the hack system. So the bad guy can just see all of his hack systems and associate them with their own unique uh, ID, user ID, if what you will. Then the next thing it does is the hack system gets the configuration file, the settings file. In this case, what it was doing, it was finding out, OK, when somebody connects to you on port 80, what you do is act as a reverse proxy, go to this mother system, get the web pages, and feed it back to the victim. That's what the configuration file is. It's showing its proxy behavior. And then finally, also, in this unique case, we saw it get a DDoS plugin, 
In other words, launch denial of service attacks also. So it had some other functionality too, but in this case, it's primarily for the proxying capability. Now, what we did is over a period of time is we went and got information on a domain name that was in flux. Like I said, nowadays, most of the domains that are um, being used for malicious behavior are in flux, like this. In this case, greatfriedrice.info, the .info. Why .info? .info domains are so much cheaper than .coms. The registers tend to be a little dodgy, as I mentioned before. In this case, we collected data for a little bit over a week. And what we were doing is querying the DNS servers every two minutes, just automated tools, querying the DNS on this domain, getting it, comparing it, seeing when it changes, tracking that information, thing along those lines. And what we found is over 3,000 IP addresses were associated with this domain. So in other words, if you were kept checking and trying to shut down this system, you would have to, if you try to shut down this domain, uh, this web server, you would have to shut down over 3,000 systems. And then at the bottom there are some interesting t statistics on which autonomous systems, which blocks of IP addresses were used in this fast flux networks. And once again, you look and you tend to see it's the big service providers, the Comcast, Roadrunners, SBC, AOL. Um, notice how big AOL and SBC are on there, which is now AT&T. So it's the home users. The, no, quite often the target for malware, things along those lines. Now let's go into a little bit, as I mentioned before, how do we detect the bad guys? How do we prevent these type of attacks? Things along those lines. We feel it's not only important to give you information on threats, but it's very important on how to defend against these threats, detect and mitigate. So first of all, what you're looking on the screen is the ability to send information on the network. Basically, it just creates a packet. The packet does um, a, uh, creates this right here, netcats it, drops it out on the network. And then what you're doing is you're looking for this information on the network, past the systems it should have connected to. So if you find this floating around on your network, you may have fast flux on your network. And then what the team has created, and they're actually using these scripts on a variety of different networks, is how to detect it, how to pick it up, and then when you find it, you can attempt to uh, shut the systems down. As I mentioned before, the problem is, is they're always changing in DNS. So one of the best ways also to detect this is in DNS itself. Now, on the mitigation side, I know, not terribly exciting, but there are a lot of ways you can actually mitigate against these threats. Um, blocking TCP 80, in other words, um, on home networks, nobody should be initiating an HTTP connection to a home network. So if the service providers are blocking that type of activity, or if you have a very large network, you are in charge of a very large network, that's something you're going to want to do. Now the mother ships, as I mentioned before, the mother ship is a, the system that controls the bots but also the system that hands out the DNS information, that hands out the web server information. They are the ones that the proxies get all the information from to things along those lines and forward that information. Now, one of the best ways also here, if you look at um, passive, oops, the uh, passive DNS harvesting, monitoring, things along those lines, keep grabbing the DNS information, looking for checks, things along those lines. There's also um, a nice little tool out there um, uh, passive um, DNS harvesting in that um, reverse, passive reverse DNS, I forget what this, uh, the uh, Russian site hosted at a German university. Anybody, I forgot what it's called. DNS passive replication. Yeah, yeah, it's hosted, at, it, but it's called the Russian, I don't know why it's got called the Russian. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's one of the, the Stuttgart uh, Russian uh, German University. And that's always very interesting because it'll give you all the, um, the domain names associated with an IP address. Okay, what I'll uh, summarize with FastFlux. It's simply another step for criminals taking strengthening their infrastructure. 
Now, what's got me concerned, what has us a lot concerned within the security community is just how little awareness there is about fast flux. One of the reasons we really put the paper out there is people are coming to us asking about it, especially folks like law enforcement, um, the service providers themselves. A lot of the service providers were not aware about this. So we wanted to put this out so that they would have a better understanding of the architecture, the issues, things along this line. Because what we're concerned about is people go out and gotten very good for shutting those systems down, the systems that are popping up all over the place. But the problem is, once those systems are shut down, other ones are popping up all over the place also. So as I mentioned before, what we're doing now is trying to make people aware of those uh, uh, situations, things along those lines. OK. Um, finish up a little bit early because what I want to do is get a chance for questions because I know this can be a little bit confusing. So I'm hoping folks out there have some questions to beat us up with. What questions would you have about DNS, fast flux, about the bad guys in general changing? A question. The general problem lies in the registrar. Uh, good question. Yes and no, there's lots of problems. If these, scenes, uh, if these systems weren't vulnerable, then they wouldn't be hacked. Um, there's more problems than just the registrars. Yes, the registrars, some of them aren't um, being very nice. They're not working with us. But there's other problems also. For those of you involved in the service provider world, there's something called domain name tasting. I don't know if some of you have heard that. Where the bad guys, and this is actually a legitimate service, the bad guys can buy a domain name for five days. And after five days, they don't like the domain name. They can return the domain name and get their money back. That was actually a leftover from years ago when marketing companies wanted to test domain names. And I believe they did some statistics about it or something where about out of 60, 70, 80 million domain names. And I'm just trying to remember from a conference I was at last week, some of the statistics brought up. Something like 60 million domain names were purchased over a certain amount of time, and 40 million of them were returned to using this domain name tasting thing. So in a lot of the ways, the bad guys can use these domain names for free and then return them. So it, it's just not one problem. It's a combination of problems. And in fact, that's one of the trends that I've been kind of worried about. And I see this in a lot of the other very good presentations, is in a lot of the ways the bad guys aren't using vulnerabilities to exploit systems, but functionality that we've created, and they're just using it against us. I think JavaScript is a wonderful example. As you see, and there's, I believe, some very good presentations today and tomorrow on JavaScript, where JavaScript was designed to do something, and the bad guys do that. But unfortunately, you know, the grabbing of cookies, the copying of cookies, things along those lines, or the, you know, the whole iframe issue. But the, in other words, we're seeing a trend where the bad guys are simply leveraging functionality, but leveraging it for their own advantage. So yes, the registrars in this fast flux example are part of the problem, but there's a lot of other problems too. Any more questions? Question. OK, interesting, a little off topic. How do you um, capture um, zero-day exploits with uh, honeypots or honey nets? Um, in a lot of ways, you don't. It depends on what type of honeypot or honey net you're using. If you're doing a server-type honeypot or honey net, you put a system on the network, and you just wait for the bad guys to come, a lot of times, you're not, most of the time, you're not going to find zero-day. Why? Because the bad guys aren't using zero-day. So they're just using commonly known exploits, commonly known tools. This gets back to the bad guys. Think about return on investment. Why are we not seeing a lot of the O-day, zero-day attacks being done? And some of the other folks like Miko can do an even better job of explaining this. But think about return on investment, because there's no need to. As long as the exploits that are widely known work, they'll be using those. Zero-day exploits cost the bad guys money. They either have to develop them, they have to buy them, they have to deal in them. That impacts their return on investment. So the O-day exploits aren't being used as widely as you might think because they're simply return on investment. Now, they're taking their exploits and changing the signatures and things like that, so it's harder to attract. But if you look at the you know, IcePAC, MPAC, a lot of the vulnerability kits out there for um, client-based attacks, most, if not all the attacks, 
are well known. They're just finding lots of patch systems. So which gets back to the question, how do you catch O-Day with honey pots and honey, honey nets? Most of the time you don't, simply because they're not being so widely used. If you're going to catch exploits or O-Day with honey pots, you tend to have better luck with something called a client honey pot. Honey pots that instead of sitting and waiting for the bad guys to connect to them, the honey pots go out to the internet and they initiate connections to web servers. Um, examples of that are something like Site Advisor, uh, Microsoft Strider Monkey. Google does this to help filter out. When you guys do go on Google and you look for, you know, you do a search on a site, search on a service, Google sometimes will go ahead and filter out some of the worst and malicious sites. They know these sites because they use client honeypots, which connects to the web server, pretends to be a client, and then if it's a malicious website, they'll be compromised. In fact, the HoneyNet project three weeks ago, no, I'm sorry, about a month ago, just released a paper on malicious websites using client honeypots. It's called Know Your Enemy, Malicious Web Servers. So if you're interested in learning more about malicious websites, or interested in learning about client honeypots, because we release all the um, software open source and all the data open source. All that information is free on our website and open source. The FastFlux paper I think we released maybe almost two months ago. Any more questions? Right, question. The question was, is if you just follow some of the basic practices, would it um, protect against these threats? And yes, we found that in our client honeypot research, where a team in New Zealand took Firefox and Internet Explorer 6 and went ahead and just searched thousands, hundreds of thousands of websites and seeing what changes those websites did. And some of the things they found is some of the, just the most basic changes to your web serving habits will make a huge impact on the ability to protect your systems. Obviously using the most patched version. Also using something like Opera. In other words, almost all the attacks were Internet Explorer focused or um, the second most popular was Firefox. So just using something like Opera on uh, Mac OS X will really do a lot to protect you. What was also interesting is we found that blacklisting was very effective. And the reason is, is it kind of comes back to the idea of fast flux or the idea of um, the iframe redirection. The reason blacklisting is so effective is that we were thought blacklisting would not work because there's so many malicious web servers out there and the blacklisting list is so short. But what ends up happening is the blacklist has all the real web servers. A lot of infected web servers or malicious web servers do nothing more than redirect you to a central server, redirecting, um, handing out all the malicious code. So it's not so much that you have to blacklist, like Bank of India, as an example. Bank of India never hacked anybody. All Bank of India did was have links to evil servers that had links to other servers da -da 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 -da, that would hack you. But the Bank of India didn't actually distribute the hacking code itself. It was just iframes to other systems. And what we found is as long as your blacklist just had the short list of all the actual servers that were malicious. That did a lot to protect your system. And things, for example, like Firefox has some blacklisting automated built into it, things like that. So it's, if your system does the basic, if you do this basic policy, the basic steps to securing your system, it does a huge job of eliminating most of the risks or mitigating most of the risks. The problem is, is there's so many people connected to the internet today who are just wide open. You know, they're using unpatched versions of Internet Explorer, going to websites they simply should not be going to, things like that. And in fact, in, um, I'm not sure how it is working in Asia, but in the West, such as in countries like in America, Canada, North America, major corporations now block a lot of web serving to sites that people shouldn't be going. And it was originally for productivity. You know, people should not be going to, you know, gambling sites, things like that, because they're wasting time. Well, the problem is now corporate, at least in a lot of corporations in America, are limiting what sites employees can go to to reduce the risk to the employees so their computers don't, um, aren't uh, compromised. Well, like I said, always when, when you're in most of the classes today, in most of the classes tomorrow, 
Think about return on investment. That's the big lesson. I mean, fast flux is very interesting. We're going to see this for a while. But a year, two years from now, it's going to change. A lot of the things we see today, things are going to change over time. Change has been a constant that I've seen in the past couple of years. And the change is more and more rapid. I mean, the storm worm is a beautiful example of it. But always, if you keep in mind, think return on investment. That's the one constant, especially in the past 12 to 18 months. It's always been about business. I think we have time for one, one more question. Got a question. I'll, I'll repeat it. Oh, OK. Um, I guess the question is, is what are some of the best tools for protecting the client system, such as with Netcraft, SiteMinder, things like that? I have not used all of them. It's a good question. I don't know. Um, I use SiteMinder. Um, one of the best protections also you can do is don't run your system as admin. Because a lot of the exploits today, and this is true not for only malicious web servers, but malware embedded in PowerPoint slides, malware embedded in doc slides. Like I said, um, Nico, who's going to be presenting after me, is far more the expert than I am on this. Um, by running your system as just a plain old user will also do a lot to protect yourself. Um, out of those tools you mentioned, I've only used SiteMinder. I'm happy with SiteMinder, but that's only an indication of a dodgy site. That's not going to actually protect you. We have time for any more questions, or is that it? OK, one more question. Uh-oh. Uh, the question is, is should we set up, um, should we block the ability for people to uh, initiate port 80 connections to home servers, home users? Yes, but I'm just a militant security guy. So I mean, you, you, you've hit on the head point. There's always a problem of security and um, functionality. And so that's some, it, the list of mitigation ideas are just many, there's a menu of ideas for you to choose from. Besides, it doesn't matter. They all just bypass whatever filtering you put on anyways. It all goes through port 80. So that's one of the other big things, too. And filtering a couple years ago solved a lot of the problems. But now, I mean, look at Skype. Skype's a beautiful example. of No matter what filtering functionality you put in, they're going to figure out a way to uh, just puncture right through the firewall. So um, as a, um, that, that's a whole other presentation of how the uh, cyber war is pretty much now on the desktop. And so that's why some of the things we were discussing earlier was really good. OK, well, I'm going to wrap things up here. You're very fortunate. There's many excellent speakers here today. They're going to be talking about a variety of interesting topics. There's a lot to be learned, so I'm excited. I'm going to be um, hanging around all day today. Unfortunately, I have to leave tomorrow, uh, go back to the States. So if you have any questions, feel free to beat me up today. I'm happy to uh, answer them. And um, I'll just be hanging around and learning from the other folks just like yourselves. But nothing else, thank you very much. OK, thank you, Lance.